much more interesting process to think about uh, where non-Indigenous people, non inuit have to deal with all of these realities that we live on a daily basis. Um, and to have the, I don't need to say bravery, but to have, to have the concentration to be able to absorb all of these things is what's needed. Um, and so how can we continue to support uh, Indigenous artists, Inuit artists to uh, express themselves truly to themselves, uh, truly to their communities, their families, uh, and, and for the, the continuous reckoning to happen is to um, allow Inuit to collaborate, uh, allow Inuit to uh, um, dream and create ideas and to support them. Um, this is a wonderful example of, of Inuit being able to work together and dream together and be completely supported in making grand ideas come to life. Uh, and all of you have benefited from it uh, as well. I mean, definitely, yeah. Um, thank you for making that point about reconciliation versus reckoning, because I think where I was coming at from that, with that question is that that seems to be oftentimes the impression that settlers come at this conversation with. So thank you for kind of uh, reorienting us in that direction. So if we are to talk about reckoning, and you know, there are, I, I'm conscious of the ways in which that we've presented a very kind of mediated interaction with Inuit traditional knowledge and culture here um, from a somewhat limited perspective as well, given that we are still students uh, in, in, in the subject matter. Um, so, you know, I, I, I kind of wonder what the other two panelists uh, want to weigh in on about this, about um, what, our responsibility becomes if we are presenting uh, Inuit cultural heritage or uh, aiming to create platforms uh, where, as Lachlan has said, uh, Inuit can come together and dream together and date together um, and we can learn from it. What are those, what do those obligations look like? I guess I could say some things. Um, I think uh, it really starts at the very, very beginning. And um, to think about, for example, what does uh, what does it mean to invite someone in? Um, and and how, um, uh, you know, so for, for example, when we began thinking about uh, doing an exhibition about Nojo Kashirak and Tenkitsilak, um, the first step has to be, at least for me and for Anna, to gather around and ask, you know, is this, is this something that you are interested in doing? And if the answer is yes, then it is to, to truly listen and be able to get all of the crap out of the way. <laughs> that sometimes uh, how I think of the work that I do, so that what Lakaluk said um, can become truly reality, you know, so that it can be by Inui, of Inui, for Inui, you know, and all mm -hmm. the institution does is create a platform, but create one that has as few barriers and obstacles as possible. and. You know, there are many, 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 some that it can be predictable and some that can be um, sudden. So I think to some, to some maybe a little bit uh, plain, uh, I think it is ultimately about establishing relationships of trust and respect. And it has to be from that place. If you don't, if you, if you don't have, if you don't have that to start with, then I don't know that whatever it is you're trying to do, will get to a good place, you know? And it isn't about good intentions because terrible things happen. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good intentions. Mm -hmm. I think it's much more basic yeah. than that. No? Yeah, the trust and relationship is absolutely 
absolutely fundamental and, and that takes time. Mm. Nothing can be rushed. If, if I Thank you. That, I would just yes, say please. that there's also a question of resources and and how how resources of any institution are allocated and and who gets to say. And I think one of the real challenges uh, of, of, of this and, and not just this moment, but as, uh, as an ongoing practice and process is ensuring that the voices of, of those who have been excluded from a say in how those resources are allocated or even how those resources are defined or how the terms of access and, and operations within an institution, so thinking about the university, um, how that happens, you know, those need to be continually rethought and reworked uh, from a place, I think, of real institutional humility, which I think is very difficult, um, because institutions are not built that way, uh, you know, and, and settler colonial traditions are really built around hierarchies and certain kinds of nomenclatures and exclusions. So making those visible, making those, uh, naming those on a regular basis and making that naming part of our, our practice, um, but also really taking up a new way and continually to working to refine how resources get identified and allocated and what are the conversations and who gets to stay around it. Um, I think is really a, a, an ongoing learning process, certainly for me, as, as someone within the institution, within an academic institution, but also as someone who is, uh, you know, a newcomer to Canada and to these conversations. And so I hope that I am entering into them with uh, sufficient humility to be able to learn and to and to acknowledge, you know, where where mistakes, you know, are being made on a regular basis. I, I hear very clearly the idea of colonization as a continuing practice. And so mm -hmm. thinking about how we can really look at reallocating the resources, including the knowledge and the naming within our institutions as an ongoing practice, I think is, is you know, a, a, an important ongoing first step that will hopefully lead us to uh, deeper and, and more transformative uh, actions uh, as, as an ongoing. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I also wonder, since you do bring up this idea of naming, uh, Sarah, um, I wonder what your thoughts are on whether we've done that to an adequate extent in our exhibition. Because, of course, um, the framework, the works, and a lot of the sort of basis for this exhibition was uh, the work that uh, the curatorial team did with the AGO. Um, but I wonder if, if we've actually uh, been able to name that as precisely as, as, as we would have liked. So I, I wonder if any of you had any thoughts on that in terms of us being able to situate ourselves in relationship to these works. Maybe that was well, I think it's, I think it's part of the other. learning process, right? Mm -hmm. That, um, you know, to what Lakuluk said about not constantly being barraged with questions, uh, what does this mean, how does this work, but rather that you take it on yourself as your own responsibility to go and learn and find out on your own because there are so many resources available. It's unbelievable. It doesn't explain interviews or you know so in other words it, it, on so many different platforms and so when i think about this exhibition and what it, it may offer is that uh we did so very much want to figure out a way to take this up north and 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 this is a kind of trial run of what that might look like right so a kind of okay well what are the challenges of putting this together and then what are the ways in which um, a space like this could be accessible in the north if that's even possible so i think the role of the university is this kind of lab where you can try things out whereas um i think at the ago we would have to have had a measurable outcome <laughs> and uh, you know in um in a much more, let's call it marketable way. 
where I think what you do here is you test things out, you try things out, but you take responsibility for the way in which you do that by learning, by listening, by you know, asking the questions you guys are asking. Um, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to do that. Um, one last sort of question along with these like, lines. Um, so we've just talked about, uh, Juliana, you brought up the idea that uh, this is a trial run for something that could potentially be used to make uh, these works accessible to people in the North. Um, and in our class, we talked a lot of, actually about digital recreation. Um, and about the new branch of the Winnipeg Art Gallery that features, um, you know, the largest collection of Indian art, I believe, in North America. Um, and uh, one of the criticisms of that uh, by Jessica Coter, who is the curator of the Nuata Sunatutangit Museum in Italiwit. Sorry? Sunakutangi. Um, Sunakutangi. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, pardon my mispronunciation. Um, and one of her criticisms was that, uh, you know, the fact that these objects are so far from none of it, um, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily go well materially um, for that process of mm -hmm. creation. And uh, lastly, which you brought up earlier, the idea that, you know, possibly virtual platforms might be removing Inuit youth even further from the land than they are already being uh, sort of led away. So um, how does then that transmission work in a digital space? And because cultural knowledge is so often embodied and constructed in relationship to a land or a particular context, um, what are possible ways of adapting that to, to a virtual format? Mm. Or is that not possible? Yeah, I mean, to go back to, to go back to um, Jessica Kutzup's, um remarks about Kaumayu, uh, they're completely valid. Uh, you know, as beautiful as Kaumayu is and as gorgeous as the exhibitions are that are being worked on by, by Inuit and curated by by Inuit that are all friends uh, within the same community, it's still not in Inuit Nunangat and in not in Inuit homelands uh, and is still benefiting white institutions exponentially more than than anything that is in Inuit homelands. Uh, you know, the city of Winnipeg, um, the government of Manitoba, the Winnipeg Art Gallery itself has benefited financially from this so much. And Nunat is actually basically just a tiny building with some one gallery of, of uh, permanent um, artifacts uh, and another gallery that has, um, you know, various shows that are literally just tacked onto the walls that change maybe twice a year and it's basically a gift store. So she's running a gift store and she's a, she's a highly educated uh, archivist. Uh, so, and I've just spent the past 10 years building an organization looking for a, a, a performing arts space. Uh, and 10 years down the line, there's still no performing arts space here. So within Inuit homelands, there is not the uh, investment in infrastructure for artists, by artists, and for the community to appreciate artists. So everything about what she said is completely valid. Um, so I think that bringing pieces of Kaumayuk uh, to Inuit Nunangad through a digital form like this is uh, is definitely a facsimile. Um, it's not like actually being able to go right up and see the the um, you know that the paint strokes, uh, the print strokes, or the the drawings uh, made by Kinoayuk and Tim with your own with your own eyes. It's it's with a borrowed head, <laughs> borrowed fingers. <laughs> Uh, but at the same time, it does, it's not a solution is what I'm saying. It is uh, a band-aid. It is, uh, an, it's an interesting exercise. It allows for us to actually be in a room together. And that is fascinating. 
but it's not the same as taking children on the land. It's not the same as people interacting with actual pieces of art. Right. I was going to add that, um, you know, when, when Sarah was talking about resources, I think maybe people automatically think about money. But I think there's a way in which uh, Southern institutions have resources uh, that we kind of forget that, in fact, they are resources, you know? So to, to not just think exclusively about money. So, you know, in thinking about the collection of the of the AGO, the Inuit Sculpture Collection, that we can provide a platform where um, Inuit students in Inuit classes can actually access this collection through our own platform, and it can be an um, Inuk who is speaking Inuit. He looked to, to the students uh, about these works. So that mm -hmm. is something that all it takes for the AGO to do is say, we're going to do that. It, it doesn't yeah. actually take so much money necessarily. It's the, I feel like, human resources or willingness to think about that and to say, okay, is this, would the community be interested in that? How can we make that happen? How would you like to see that? And all we're doing is creating that open um, access to the sculptures that we have of course not in real in real life uh, but even just the fact that you know that they're there because so often indigenous communities don't even know that their belongings are held in museums because the museums does not have the collection accessible online or in, really in any other way so mm -hmm. a resource would be just making it available on the internet for everyone to know what we hold in our in our collection for example uh, right. even that is a very simple resource that we can do simply because we're going to do it you know yeah yeah i can imagine i can imagine friends of mine looking up their late father's artwork googling his yeah. name and then seeing all of this come up in various galleries right yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If I may, I think there's also a danger in thinking about uh, in thinking about these in binary terms that it's either uh, or that the that the virtual is going to replace or somehow uh, supplant um, or you know make up for uh, a, a certain kind of experience or or indeed uh, you know compensate for something that has been lost. Like thinking about the comment and uh, about reconciliation, for example. And I think it's, it's much more helpful, at least as I encounter and engage with virtual reality and, and other kinds of digital environments, to think of them as augmentation, that these are things that can perhaps be bridges to other kinds of understandings to facilitate, uh, you know, different kinds of reckonings or different kinds of awareness that can mm -hmm. uh, speak across distances that are not otherwise uh, possible. But at the end, it's, it's the goal can't be this in and of itself, right? Mm -hmm. the, the goal or the, the idea is that this is an augmentation of something else. And if we can use that to guide and uh, to, to focus attention back into communities, to bring attention to things like the lack of a performing arts center, if a, if a, a number of virtual exhibits or online access to, to collections at the AGO can make, uh, you know, can facilitate then, okay, how do we gather the material resources needed in order to create community uh, infrastructure in and on the land uh, for the people who are there? Like that to me is, is really what, what these kinds of engagements are about and what the, what the real joy of, of virtual environments are. And that it's always, I think, mm. a kind of conversation between these two and a spectrum across the virtual and the material that but it doesn't have to be an either or, or only one, or to think of this as somehow, you know, if we can do a virtual exhibit, that's sufficient and, and kind of where we leave it. And, and as you're sort of raising things, there's some really important questions that doing work like this raises that takes us in, in new and interesting places. I, think. I like the way that you frame that as, a, as an augmentation and, and supplementary to, to real life. That's wonderful. Thank you, thank you so much. And that's uh, about the end of my question. And now I will turn over 
uh, the proverbial microphone to Liz. <laughs> Thank you, Vince. Um, Where is Liz? My question. Hi, I'm here. I just got kicked uh, out and I hurried back in, so there's no name. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so just allow me to adjust my headset as I try to read my notes. Um, so my question is much more personal than previous. Um, as I am a first-generation Canadian, uh, my question is, what role have first-generation and immigrated Canadians ought to be playing in the overall movement of repatriation of Indigenous culture and, and arts? Um, because just uh, to overshare about myself a little bit, I've been so deeply wrapped in the exploration of my own diasporic identity. I really haven't given this, the amount of attention and care required as someone who benefits from uh, Southern like West, I guess, white culture that I haven't seriously considered Indigenous arts as much as I should have now that I'm looking at the show and having worked on it. So I guess and I have felt this weird tension of like the white guilt, but also the Indigenous people. So I just I have been struggling with where, where do I fit in the narrative, I guess, and where do people like me fit in that narrative? Um, yes, it's a um, totally valid question. Uh, and I would say your major role is in uh, engaging the institutions that have allowed you to grow up um, without having been exposed to Indigenous cultures. Um, for example, have you ever learned any of the words from uh, from the, the homeland that you live in? Uh, and shouldn't you have learned that in school? Um, you know, I went to elementary school in, in Saskatchewan, in, in Cree, in Dakota, um, and, and Dene homelands. Did I learn any of those words? Not at all. Um, so it's it's actually a question of, as first generation Canadians, or you know, whatever, five, fifth generation white Canadians, of making sure these institutions pay attention to the people of those lands, so that it be, it uh, it becomes a natural part of the next generation growing up. Um, and I guess I have a follow up question of uh, just again, just to learn things and learn to appreciate culture. Would there be opportunities to possibly be in touch with uh, youths, Indigenous youth, Inuit youths, um, to talk? Because I feel like um, there aren't enough opportunities to do so in a an open environment to, to discuss like what youths think about uh, issues like this and I would really be interested in engaging in people like that if there was like for example uh, uh, okay, like uh, exchange programs or some kinds of events perhaps that AMPD could uh, organize if that's like on the table or uh, a possibility. Sorry. I didn't that's catch that acronym. Faculty at York. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> that thing, got it. I'm exactly. so sorry. I'm just, yeah. No, no, no. We produce the acronyms like no, no, no nothing else. Yeah, I don't know what to say. Yeah, yeah. Again, uh, go back to researching uh, Inuit youth or other indigenous group youth, uh, there's an awful lot of activity amongst Inuit youth. Um, and there's uh, there's also a lot of, um, you know, outreach programs between cultures as well. Um, and, you know, a lot of universities, especially that are close to Inuit urban centers, have a lot of Inuit students uh, attending them, and there's um, yeah, there's activity going on there too. So yeah, get on to uh, searching for them uh, and uh, seeing seeing how you can engage in in uh, dialogue. It's um, yeah, and and again, keep in mind that you're not going in to to mine them for information, but that you're interested in in. Uh, Collaboration and exchange. You, you have to under. You have to become humble and um, want to simply listen if they want you. <laughs> right. Awesome. Thank you. And just to your last question, everything is always on the table in a university. Um, you know, I think the moment that a that a that a learning institution, that a teaching institution, that a research institution 
says something is off the table, then that's when we stop really pursuing our mission. Right? So everything, it's not to say that everything will be realized or in the way that it's first imagined, but every, you know, we should be constantly putting new ideas and, and new suggestions for us. We should be constantly looking for what we can do and, and who we can engage and what is needed from, from which communities and who are we not uh, talking to. So yes, the, the short answer is that yes, of course, of course that's on the table. Uh, as is, you know, almost anything we can imagine. Uh, you know, we just have to then decide, you know, what are what are the priorities and how do we achieve that and, and what is needed to do that and, and how do we educate ourselves and then how do we form meaningful partnerships um, with others so that we can be uh, of service while we're developing um, the work for ourselves as well. And, and not to interject because I know I'm not supposed to be answering questions here, but there is, um, so I'm Bangladeshi and there, there are like a, a small number of South Asian diaspora folks who live in none of it. Um, and one of them actually has a really great um, TikTok and Instagram presence. Their name is Anupa Mumin. And like, so oh, they're a really good kind of- Anupa's link. in Toronto. <laughs> yeah, she is. She is, she is, she's great. Um, and so like she's a really good sort of point of contact also like if you're trying to go with somebody who like maybe understands part of like a diasporic experience but also like has lived in the most like most of her life um and then moved down south okay. um so yeah yeah just just bear in mind you should say nunavut not none of it nunavut sorry there you go yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there is a uh, there is a good uh, south good size South Asian community. There's it's, you know the Qadarid is quite international. There are uh, more Eritreans that live in Qadarid than Greenlanders like me. Oh wow! But we're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, Yeah, it, it, it must have been. 